So we're going to do a real long form reaction. I'm going to try to, to, to pause it enough to add, obviously, fair use spin on it, make my own thoughts, the whole nine. But I also don't want to do that just for the sake of doing it. Um, I have not seen a whole lot of Robotech. What I have seen, I like, uh, but I, I'm not near as familiar with it as I am a lot of other anime. Um, anyway, I, I, I want to really like, like soak this in, digest this. And, uh, I, yeah, I will give my commentary where I can, but this is called how psychopaths hijacked the gaming industry. Jim, you ain't got no room to talk with some of the stuff you sent me. Uh, that's yeah. This might be the only one. Maybe we can get through one other tonight. But the one hour starts now, and we are going to react to this. <laughs> Remember what they took from you? That's a good way to start this off. Hey, Internets. So there's an interesting thing about mainstream gaming journalism, which is that if you were to jump into Wing. a time machine and go Hold back on. anywhere between two to four decades, roughly between the 1980s and early 2000s, there's something there that you're going to find in most gaming magazines that is largely absent from mainstream gaming journalism you'll find online today, which is that these magazines almost exclusively talk about, well, video games. And not only that, but they're actually pretty Man. darn interesting. How many of you guys collected those magazines growing up? Like, like I had such a fat fucking stack of those, and I still have a few left. I know that I've got some 2005 issues of Nintendo Power. I know I got some 2003 issues of PlayStation uh, Magazine. Um, I think it was called PlayStation 2 Magazine at the time, actually. It wasn't even called PlayStation Magazine yet. Uh, I, I know I've still got some 2007 issues of Game Informer and Game Pro. Um, I had a bunch of tips and tricks books. Like, yeah, like Daxner says, the good old days, dude. I I, I remember I, I was telling this on a, on a different, uh, I think it was on Saturday Night Hypnosis, actually. I was telling this story. Was um We would go into the Walmart and we were broke and we couldn't afford the magazines. So I would just like go over to the cheat code magazines, like the tips and tricks and stuff, and write the cheat codes down and take them home. And I would do that for months until one day me and my little brother came into Walmart and all the cheat code magazines started coming in sealed bags. They must have fucking known that kids were pulling that shit. Ah. Oh. The good old days. Now, fortunately, you don't actually have to jump into a time machine to do this. Anybody can check it out for themselves. There's actually a website that lets you download a lot of old gaming magazines from these times and read them. What you'll find is that articles were largely written pretty fairly and were very interesting to read and kept politics and ideology largely out aside from the extremely rare obscure joke. The writing style was about video games for video gamers. And one of the reasons for this is you could tell... I, 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 I said I'm going to pause it as low as I can. And to be fair, I am. I am going to. However, he mentioned something that I think a lot of people either don't know or don't forget. Um, These magazines were fucking hilarious. Like, there was, he's right, politics involved in them. But again, they were, they were jokes. They were not ideological so much so as they were like low-hanging fruit. And it wasn't just political. They would make all sorts of jokes. If you ever read like the, the letters to the editor sections, those are usually more fun than the actual game reviews and stuff. The letters of the editor sections were always my favorite part of these magazines because they were so goddamn funny. I specifically remember one one art or one letter that said, uh, uh, it, it, this this was written to Game Informer, I believe, and they wrote, "Help! I think I might be uh, becoming a Sonic the Hedgehog fan. What do I do?" And they wrote back, "If it's on the Genesis, it's good. Play it away. If it had, it if it's on the Genesis, it's good. Play away. If it has any ki character in it that isn't uh, Knuckles or Tails, it's shit." Like I was like, "Damn, okay, I'm fucking attacked." Like pretty easily that the articles were actually being written by people who were also gamers. And that's not all. Even the advertisements in these magazines are pretty darn interesting and give you a decent idea of what the feel of the game is going to be. And the reviews tend to focus largely on the gameplay and what you were getting for your money. The idea of a gaming review back then focusing on whether or not the game subscribes to the correct ideology or has the correct moral opinions trademark was almost completely unheard of. In addition to this, gaming journalism used to include a lot of useful cheat codes and tips in regards to games that were almost impossible to find otherwise. They also included various detailed walkthroughs 
that had visualizations that were, you know, actually useful and actually comprehensive. And again, like written said, by nice people who right? clearly took the time to go through everything and find all the secrets. Anyways, the point is, you can tell by while reading it that it's clearly made for gamers by gamers. I remember enjoying reading a lot of these back in the 1990s, I love chaotic and I decided to reread a lot of them recently just to see if it was just the nostalgia talking or not. And as it turns out, it's not nostalgia. The writing back then was just overall better quality, and most importantly, stayed on topic. This is unfortunately in stark contrast to what we see today. This Snap back to the present, and, and a lot of video on. game journalism looks like, well, whatever the heck this thing is supposed to be. No, seriously, what is this garbage? Did someone get confused on whether they wanted to make a publication about gaming or about yoga instruction and positive affirmations or whatever the current normie feel-good buzzwords happen to be? Where are the walkthroughs? Where are the tips and tricks? Well, see, it's funny you say this, Peter Bateman fan site, back when gaming media had actual brains involved because game journalists back then were journalists. That is what they, like, like, like by definition what journalism is, they, it, this was legitimate journalism. They were interviewing producers. They were interviewing individuals that wrote code. They were writing articles about the games, about stories. They were analyzing. Like they were, they were following up on stories. It was journalism, but it was journalism specifically for gaming culture, a, a subset of culture. Like no different than people who would do like food articles and whatnot, which was another common thing throughout all of, you know written history or sports journalism. Like game journalism, what it was a career, and uh, how we got to where it is now, where where the idea of journalism just means politics in disguise, is fucking wild. Where are the actual secrets that a gamer might have trouble finding? Where's the well anything at all that a gamer might care about? Seriously, this is complete, total garbage. Where did the good stuff go? And you might be able to forgive them just a little bit, because again, of course, today is the day of the internet. In modern times, of course, you can just Google it and find tips, tricks, and walkthroughs and whatnot on places like GameFAQs. Overall, it's actually a lot easier to find this stuff these days than in the past. But that doesn't excuse them for being terrible at the one thing that's left, which is largely just editorials. Which, these days in modern gaming journalism, usually the topic will start out with gaming, but it will often quickly go off topic from there, often talking about things that no gamer should give the slightest crap about or review. And this is the reason that me and Hypno and Badger and Atreus and Cassie all have YouTube careers is because they do this. Here's the dealio. I would be doing something completely different on YouTube if it were. I, I would still be. In fact, this is my third attempt at a channel as the only one that I've been able to stick with. The, the, the first one took a heavy toll on my health because it had to do with drinking, and uh, uh, you can only sustain that for so long. The second one, I only got three videos in before my my uh, you know computer was fucking stolen when my entire apartment was broken into and all my recording equipment was stolen. Uh, and, and so... By the time my third attempt at a channel rolled around, when I knew PC and everything, this was what I wanted to do. But, it, but, but it, if, if this whole woke culture stuff had never happened, that would still be on YouTube. I would just be doing an entirely different type of video. Maybe, maybe video essays, maybe anime rankings, maybe reviews. You know, who knows? There's a myriad of things I love doing. Uh, but because of the modern day incompetence of game journalists and others like them, I, I, I got a career. And, and, and frankly... I don't plan on stopping doing this. And once the woke culture, nonsense, culture war stuff ends, okay, great. I will get to go in and start making fucking like history of Ocarina of Time videos or whatever it is. I ain't fucking stopping doing YouTube videos once the culture war stuff is, is starting to slow down. I will just shift my focus to things that I care about and love, much like these original games journalists actually did care about the the love and and, and you know prestige of gaming as an art form viewing games based on whether or not they have the correct ideology rather than whether or not their game is actually good. <laughs> and further interjections are made by these random shaky allegations against certain studios for sexism, racism, bigotry, it and will end that allegations which usually come will with will very end. little to no evidence, when, other than the yet. fact that Adjourno was saying so, and therefore we're supposed to oh, pretend that it's so automatically much, true. Philip, the point here that. is, game journalists in the modern era can be, be forgiven over the fact that they only focus on editorials due to the, how the internet works. If those editorials were actually good, but they're not. It's complete and total garbage. And there have been a lot of scandals recently that people have been talking about in regards to this subject. Subjects like Gamergate 2 and the Sweet Baby incident, or various game journalist publications all consolidating into one publication, because hey, they all have the exact same opinions anyway, so why not just fuse? As well as stories of blatant extortion and studios being forced to include well, DEI on, standards and woke propaganda. 
Is that? Hey, look, say, say I'll get a video there. Yeah, I wonder if they're games, hit unless they be hit with like bad press and general poor coverage, all because they refuse to bend the knee. And the truth is that all of these takes that people have been having lately and all of the scandals that have been happening are all a part of an overarching oh, problem. Jimmy. So in this video, I'm going to go over the problems of gaming journalism in the gaming industry over the years, explain how this disastrous mess came to be, as well as going over solutions that anyone can choose to be a part of. Because the unfortunate truth here is that all these recent videos about Gamergate 2, Sweet Baby Inc., Woke Ideal logical takeover, biased journalism, and low-quality games are in fact all components of a cancerous tumor that has been infecting and killing video games journalism and to a much degree the entire gaming industry as a whole. Yes, these are a these are a symptom. He, he is exactly I, I love his initial setup here. His initial setup for this is really good because he lay he, he is laying out what all of us talk about. Uh, but he, he the way he is introducing this to the idea of potential normies um is very well done. If you had never heard of this culture war stuff, if this is your introductory video to it, I'm sure you would have a very firm grasp of what he's talking about at this point, but still be wondering, okay, but where did it come from? Because yeah, everything that we talk about are our symptoms. They're not the actual problem themselves. For quite some time now. So what you are about to watch here is the story of how this beloved industry has become infected with narcissistic, great, woke, ideologically driven activists who have abused legal and financial power dynamics in order to force their way into gaming and pervert it from within, resulting in the trash fire of corruption and rot we see today. Or in simpler terms, this is the story of how gaming has been twisted into far left propaganda. But before I get into that, let me just state that this video is not sponsored by anyone and will likely oh, end up earning limited shot. ad revenue due to the fact that I will be stating things that, while demonstrably true, go heavily against certain established narratives. So if you wish to support me, I'm currently holding a limited time sale for the two shirts on my merch store that are relevant to this video. I've also created some sweet mug versions for people who wish to be more discreet. Alternatively, you can support me on Ko-Fi or Subscribestar, or for those of you who don't have any money, no worries, feel free to subscribe and just Video. I'm going to start this off with the big guns. The primary cause of how gaming journalism has destroyed its credibility and the reason why its current state should be regarded as entirely fraudulent. And this reason is the unfortunate fact that mainstream game journal publications over time have replaced or in some cases converted the journalists who were actually gamers with journals who are little more than prestige seeking cathedralites. And of course, the immediate question is, what the heck is a prestige seeking cathedralite? So let's go over that, because this is actually the most important concept that is needed to be able to grasp specifically how the gaming industry became twisted into this propaganda mill we see today. The term prestige seeking cathedralite comes from Curtis Yarvin's idea of the cathedral, which is this observation of this interesting mystery that the modern world's legitimate and prestigious intellectual institutions, even though they have no central organizational connection, behave in many ways as if they were a single organizational structure. Or in other words, this mystery of how a lot of... So, so, I, I assume there's going to be something similar to that. Basically, they operate as if they're a church. Like... Of journalists and academic institutions, despite being decentralized... Yeah. Seem um, to behave as if it's all one big giant echo chamber circle jerk. And the reason this happens is because of ideological capture. It's not called the cathedral to try and insult the Catholic Church, but rather it's just a reference to the phenomenon that happens if, say, one becomes the primary ideology of said intellectual institutions. Especially if said ideology is extremely dogmatic and extremely intolerant towards competing ideologies. What happens if such an ideology becomes dominant is that people who do not bend the knee to that ideology are ultimately kicked out. Uh, to, be, to be fair, Boost, the, the reason, so I, I get what you're saying, hey, stop using big words and whatnot, but when you're talking about something like this, there is an inherent problem that people have. When you use really simple terms, like, like earlier he said, oh, basically how games journalists become left, uh, you know, left-leaning ideology. Like, okay, yeah, but there that, that has such a partisan sound to it. When you use these academic-sounding terms, and this is something the left is actually really good at, which is why people for a long time still took games journalists and Kotaku and all this seriously. The reason why this woke culture you know, uh, affected us to the degree it was was because they sounded intellectual. So really, he's playing their own game from the opposite side. I, I think that's brilliant. Yes, you could say it the easy way, but saying it the easy way makes you sound uneducated and like you just have a bias going in. But if you use the academic terms like he is doing when you play this, their own game like he's doing all of a sudden it lends a, uh, some credence and credibility to your argument and i think that's excellent out of the institutions because what they said is immediately deemed to be wrong think trademark this also creates an incentive for the people who wish to stay within those institutions to make sure that they are only publishing work that aligns with said correct opinions or in other words in order to seek prestige within their institution or to increase their rank 
they must ensure that whatever they're saying or whatever they're writing always aligns with the correct think trademark opinions trademark from said dogmatic ideology. Now, in the context of today, that ideology that's really great, happens that's to right. be the cult of woke, which comes from the idea that a lack of diversity and equity inclusion implies that something unfair or nefarious has happened, and far-left activists will use this to justify their agenda. It also includes envy and hatred directed at groups that are deemed to be successful, because again, the lack of DEI must be their fault, as those groups are somewhat ironically collectively accused. So, of- there's a very, uh, I get what you're saying, Dempsey. If you can't explain something simply, you do not understand it well enough. Again, it's not a case of can't understand, uh, I can't state it simply. I bet this dude can. He seems to have a lot of the same ideologies, you know, like, again, me, Hypno Atreus, all you guys watching, things to that effect. However, it, it, not explaining it, he's choosing not to, something, to explain something simply. It's not that he cannot do it. Okay, at least, this is, this is my assumption. It's not that he can't do it. It's that he's choosing not to do it. Again, playing them at their own game discrimination. This provides an immediate explanation for why the games industry in the West reached a boiling point a little over a decade ago, where they suddenly hated you if you were a straight white male. Straight men are perceived to be on top of the progressive stack, and thus, in accordance to how woke ideology justifies punching upwards, this created a justification for forcibly reducing their numbers. In regards to gaming, this is especially noticeable because the largest demographic of people who identify as hardcore gamers tend to be, again, straight men, which the cult of woke, again, of course, views as a toxic element that has to be Removed. And thus the justification was put in place for gamers to be replaced by prestige seekers. The prestige seeking cathedralites we see today are thus the people who are willing to push and bow down to this ideology or cult of woke in order to maintain their prestige within the industry that has essentially become dominated by woke ideology. Whether they actually believe in this ideology or not, it okay, so right. Johnny Boy Winslow here says that uh, the left like to use big complicated words to sound smarter and uh, slash more educated. That left um the, to the left it adds credibility to their arguments even if they are wrong or misuse the words yes you're exactly correct i for example when when i make my videos i speak intentionally dumb i i try to sound like a very baseline normal individual uh because that's that's the most relatable way to go about it for most people however these these gaming ideologues uh these these, you know so-called journalists they don't want to be relatable they want to be perceived exactly like you're saying as above everybody and they think the best way to go about that is to use these big complicated words. Now, I urge you, I cannot tell you how many times I've been called a moron, been called dumb, all these negative things in my comments, which is fine, fucking go for it, I don't care. But I get called the, these negative things because I use very simple terms. Uh, but those simple terms are what get it across, in my opinion, in the most relatable fashion. However, yeah, I, I could probably use more academic terms and and get individuals to 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 I probably get very different style of comments and very different style of viewers. And those aren't the type of viewers or comments that I particularly want, or I think are are good for the conversation is irrelevant, as due to the intolerant nature of wokeness, they're forced to bow down in order to just honestly keep their jobs. So some of them are grifters, while some of them are true believers, but all of them are present-seeking cathedralites. Or you pretty much have to be one in order to get in with the in-crowd in this industry these days. This is why all these game journalist publications all seem to have the same opinions, and why so many games designed today in the West tend to have the same boring, predictable, woke activist-infused plot lines. It is simply the result of the fact that in order to be successful in this industry these days, They have to be prestige seekers within the Cathedral of Wokeness. One important thing to understand that this is not a conspiracy theory. Rather, this is just a logical, mathematically inevitable conclusion of what happens when an intolerant ideology becomes the dominant ideology within any kind of institution. It is simply a result of the fact that anybody who resists that ideology will get kicked out until there's basically nobody left except true believers. Bingo, Dempsey, yes. Both of these have been rewarded even when under. However, one thing a lot of people get wrong about the decentralized gatekeeping that the Cathedral does is that it's not inherently a bad thing. Sometimes this kind of intolerance is entirely justified. For instance, it makes perfect logical sense for an intellectual academic institution to be intolerant towards people who are low IQ or those who show a consistent lack of intellectual integrity or fraudsters who publish papers with fake data. A good intellectual institution that wants to remain good obviously must do its best to expunge incompetent individuals. The problem here is that woke ideology does exactly the opposite of this. Because it views disproportionate group success as a sign of a great sin of mud discrimination and seeks to replace that group, the woke cathedral of today is inherently cacistocratic, which means that it ends up placing the least... I just realized, we're doing the reaction portion. I got vodka. Give me a moment, guys. ...least intelligent and most dishonest people in charge, as opposed to the natural order. The people who are willing to lie and stretch the truth and say stupid things in favor of DEI and Marxist propaganda are the ones who gain prestige. 
while people who call out the logical inconsistencies of this ideology ultimately are not granted prestige and are, in many cases, shoved out. So that just brings up the question for the next section of this video. How in the heck did this happen? Well, the first thing that needs to be understood is the fact that wokeness in the video game industry these days is really just a branch off wokeness in general. Woke ideology has infected the mainstream media in general not just the video game industry. So really, you're just looking at one component of a larger problem that needs to be understood in order to fully understand how everything came to be, which is a pretty big deal because the effects... And, he, and, and this is the difference. Uh, and I mean this in a good way, Scooby Pup. So you say his large words make my brain hurt. It's making me think. I, I would say that that is a good thing. The fact that it's making you think there is an argument to be made for, the, for example, the type of, of, of co uh, commentary I do, which is I say it simply... So you don't really have to think so much so as you just have to be like, oh, I never thought of it that way. You know, I, I basically I, I'm trying to challenge the way people look at things, whereas th uh, this style of video and, and the words he's using are making you think in general, challenging the, the, the critical thinking aspect, which, again, I think there's a place for, for both. So, yeah, I, I would say that's a, a net positive of this propaganda can be seen pretty strongly in the polls. For example, DEI initiatives are very unpopular with the general public. <laughs> Gemini, Most people do not actually like comment. woke ideology. However, because propaganda tells people that DEI is good, people will say that they agree with DEI if they're asked if they agree with DEI and aren't giving anything specific. For example, a YouGov poll asked people if they were in favor of defunding all diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Most people opposed that. However, when people are asked if they actually support a policy specifically that happens to be a DEI policy, people overwhelmingly oppose it. For example, a Gallup poll found that most people believed it was a good thing that the Supreme Court banned race in college admission decisions, and by a pretty massive margin. And this is a pretty common theme. You ask people if they support DEI, and a lot of people will say yes, but then you ask those same people if they support a policy that is pro-DEI, and those same people will say no. This just kind of shows the silly effects of the propaganda. And I have had those conversations with individuals in real life. Like, that is... It, it, it is so much fun to be talking to somebody who is ideologically opposed to you and, and, and they talk about, you know, all this woke propaganda stuff, but then you give them a specific instance. You know, you, you talk about, you use Asians for an example. I, like, like, you know, I think that's what the, the, the photos were. I was also reading the chat. But I'm pretty sure that's what the photos um, he pulled up in the video did. Like, hey, you know, uh, is it okay that colleges are discriminating against Asians in favor of, of blacks who have not earned their place in the school? And all of a sudden, They've got to jump through some hoops to try and justify it because they know in their heart of hearts, oh, yeah, discriminating against Asians, that's wrong. But they don't want to admit it because they have already tied themselves to that ideological viewpoint when you just give the blanket DEI statements of like, oh, hey, you know, we should help underprivileged minorities or we should help minorities in general. Uh, don't even say underprivileged, just help minorities in general. You know, Jews, Asians, those are minorities depending on where you're at. Like, like really, if you want to really make their fucking brain wiggle, you talk about gingers. Gingers. Gingers are, if I recall, less than 2% of the world population. So by that metric, white people with green eyes and red hair are far more of a minority than your average black person. But you bring it up like that and they will fight you tooth and nail because they've already committed to this ideology of, oh, black people are automatically the worst off. They're automatically the, the minority, this, that, and the other. It's, it's real fun to pull this shit on him that we're seeing. When asked a non-specific question, people are simply giving the answer that they are expected to say. This shows that many Americans in the West have been fooled into supporting DEI ideology without actually understanding what it is. This is a very typical sign of a population that has been propagandized. It shows that there's a huge chunk of the population that has been tricked into thinking that they support something which they don't actually support. And where is that propaganda coming from? Well, the answer is pretty much everywhere. It exists in Hollywood. It exists in cable TV news. It exists in our schools as well as in higher education and academia. And it's really not all that surprising. Curtis Yarvin's concept of the cathedral initially had nothing to do with the games industry, and was just about journalism plus academia as a whole. Oh, and it also exists in the law. Yeah, that's right. This is something a lot of people miss. The element of the state. You see, the reason the woke left tends to win culture wars and win on policy is because it's illegal for them to lose. Yep, that's right, a big portion of wokeness is law, or at the very least, a legal power structure that they can very easily exploit. I've pointed this out before on my video. This is, I think I know where he's about to go with this. However, I'm I'm pretty interested in it because uh, when you point this, what I assume he is going to talk about is, you know, a lot of like uh, anti-discrimination acts and things to that effect. And they're going to, he's going to use these 
made up ideological power structures to to basically uh, is how the left strong arms their positions through. When all reality, again, it, they're just going to use surface level generic terms to make it sound like, oh, you're breaking the law if you don't give so and so person X percent interest rate. When in all reality. You're not breaking the law at all. You're not giving them an interest rate based on, you know, let's say their credit. But if black people have a disproportionately bad credit, I keep using black people as an example. That's probably going to say a lot about me, but it is what it is. If black people disproportionately have lower credit scores uh, and low credit scores are not, you know, you can't get, you know, funding for your house, for example, it'd be based on your credit score, it's going to look racist. So they're really just using the optics of the law, not the law itself. But I'm just guessing what he's going to say. Let, let, let's see on civil rights, but the TLDR of it is that the basis of woke ideology uses claims that unequal outcomes are discrimination in order to justify envy directed towards Bingo. groups of people Literally that are just disproportionately said. deemed as successful by falsely accusing them of building their success off the exclusion of others. Despite the fact that this way of thinking is demonstrably untrue as disparate that. outcomes do not actually prove discrimination, the ideology is already enshrined into law regardless. And this is absolutely perfect for the Marxist brand of wokeness. Marx's ideas of class consciousness and discrimination fit perfectly in into this framework. And you can see this in section seven, improving discrimination or disparate impact, that the civil rights anti-discrimination laws can be abused by these quote cultists to be legally enforced purely based on unequal outcomes. If you read it and look at establishing disparity, you will see it written, a typical disparity measure involves a comparison between the proportion of persons in the protected class who are adversely affected by the challenged practice and the proportion of persons not fair, in the Bush? protected class who Asians are adversely kind of are. affected. Now, yeah. This is what the law actually says, and it is pure Marxist insanity. They can basically accuse any unequal outcome they see as being in violation of Section 7. This is one of the big things that enables woke consulting firms to go to a company, tell them that one of their practices is having an adverse effect on a protected class, and then effectively extort the company by telling them they need to pay the consultants for guidance on how to fix the adverse effect via yeah, on, on a On a macro level, you're absolutely correct, Bush. You, you are 100% correct. On a macro level, if someone black or white can't get a home loan, it has nothing to do with their fucking skin color. You are entirely correct. There are is the micro level where you, you have the one in a million chance of getting a racist dude at the bank who denies you unfairly. But that being said, it, it's just like the good cops, bad cops sort of uh, argument. You cannot blame the actions of one bad cop as a, as a bad apple for, you know, all the good cops out there. Just like you cannot blame the micro individual racist as an act of, uh, of a systemic, uh, you know, systemic racism, which doesn't actually exist. And that is where they get you. They will make the argument. They will make it in very vague terms that, Oh, look at the systemic racism because of these one or two cherry picked cases of in individual racism and that person gets fired i have detailed files if they get caught they get fired yes absolutely i mean that that is the way it's supposed to work now all systems even the best systems have got fucking flaws in them doesn't matter how much you love windows xp it did have some problems like, like at the end of the day that is the scenario we want to happen you encounter a, 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 an individual racist on the micro level you call them out they get fired the whole nine that is not necessarily always how it goes down which because that's not necessarily how it always goes down is what gives the left and the marxists an inflated sense of their ideology being correct because they can strong arm you into believing their ideology because they can cherry pick these one-off situations that are frankly incredibly rare a black couple got their house appraised twice. The first time was lower than the second. The second time they got uh, their white friends to play the owners. Bingo. That, yeah. Cryptic Beats is 100% correct. Instances like that do happen. The, 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 the crux is we need to find out the basically the vector point of is this happening more often than not? What is the, the uh, you know, uh, are there other determining factors? Are there other variables? And when stuff like that happens, you call it out, you put the kibosh on it, you make the uh, the individuals doing the appraisal persona non grata, uh, bingo, bingo, bongo. It's it's just a matter of, is it a systemic problem or is it a, a, a problem on the individual level? And nine times out of 10, it's on the individual level. And that's also exceedingly rare. Now it might be more common in some areas than others. That's going to depend on a lot of geographical and, and, and frankly, um, economical circumstances, you would probably see something like that a whole lot more in uh, small town, um, less well off 
uh, areas when it comes to you know being income based or class based uh, than you would see it in like you know West Hollywood. If you go to West Hollywood and you have a house appraised, it probably ain't gonna fucking matter if you're black or white. That shit gonna get you know jacked through the roof. It also has to do with oh, what what are the powers that be? Look at this person individually. Remember, they tried to claim that Mar-a-Lago was worth like what seventeen million dollars or something like that when every single other house in the in the same general area, uh, all the other properties, not house, all the other properties were in the literal hundreds of millions. Because the power systems hate Donald Trump, they intentionally underappraised, uh, notably underappraised his property. At that point, well, hey, it's happening to Donald Trump. That's a white dude, an orange dude, but a white dude. So we can't even say it's a race thing. It is very much a a, a problem with the, the the system and those who are in control. Yeah, 13. See, I almost said 13 million and I thought I was wrong. I was like, okay, maybe it was 17 million because 13 million seems too low even for them. Fuck, I should have gone with my gut. Opting DEI standards in their HR department, hiring diversity officers, or going back to the topic of video games, forcing inclusion and woke ideology into their story, or for major game journalist publications, only hiring journalists who hold correct trademark opinions. And then, of course, once Marxist activists fill the ranks of the HR department and diversity officers, they are then allowed to practice discrimination of their own, only hiring other people who subscribe to the Marxist ideas, which is another stupid thing about the way civil rights laws are enforced, as it's enforced by equity or equal outcomes, which is interesting because that doesn't actually stop discrimination. For the same reason that unequal outcomes do not prove that there is discrimination, equal outcomes don't necessarily prove that there is not discrimination. This means that a woke activist working in an HR department can discriminate against anybody who isn't also a woke activist, so long as they're sure to include an equal number of people from the protected classes. For example, they'll still hire white males, but only the ones that are fully indoctrinated with white be a real reason video. This is a very important thing right to understand here. about the extortion we see. But anyway, the point is that this gives legal backing oh, to these consulting nice. firms. They can not only threaten with bad press and not getting ESG funds, they can also, if push comes to shove, take things as far as an aggressive, frivolous, anti-discrimination lawsuit. Now, here's the thing. Disparate impact has been the law for just over half a century. So the wokes have had this as a nail bat for which to aggressively force you their ideology to others for a very long time. And it's even worse for multinational corporations, in this case, game publishers who wish to reach a global audience, because there are even more laws like this in other countries, and they have to abide by every single one of them. When you realize this, it suddenly becomes pretty obvious why it's so easy for the far left activists to win, because they can just abuse the courts to cry bully their way. I'll be real. I think he's overcomplicating it here. I mean, don't get me wrong. He is technically correct. But remember what I said earlier in the stream about being technically correct when we were talking about Melanie Mack. Like, yeah, what he's saying legally makes sense, but that's not even what the left does. I mean, the left does do that, but they aren't making an appeal based on the law. They make their appeal based on emotion, which you already covered. Like th this other stuff really is set dressing and, and, and you know, is window dressing and, and salad, you know, word salad. Like, I, it's, it's not word salad because again he is correct, but most people who are not you know logically inclined, i.e., women. No offense to women in the chat, but let's be real. Traditionally, dudes are more logical oriented and women are more emotional oriented. So when you make these appeals to women, uh, you are going to have a far easier time in the legal system now that we have far more women in positions of power in the legal system, whether it be lawyers, judges, the whole nine. So you don't even need this law-based answer because you can boil it down to the emotional answer to victory if they need to. So what has happened as a result from this is woke activists have been able to slowly worm their way into the ranks of various institutions, from the state to academia to the media, and of course, video games, which is again, just one branch of the tree, and then subvert those institutions from within, increasing their ranks even further. And this is why it was more than just gaming that seemed to suddenly go woke crazy starting around the late 2000s. It infected everything from the education system to politics to Hollywood. If you think of culture as a pot and each of these components as frogs being slowly boiled, it makes perfect sense they would all die around the same time. So what we well, really it, saw it happen around the 2010s to, it didn't really is that these activists first, simply reached a large enough portion of the ranks largest, to the point where they uh, can effectively control society. Somewhere. It, it, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm trying to pause as little as I can, but anyway, it also seemed to impact gaming first or impact gaming the most because since gaming is the largest entertainment industry in the world, and I bring that up in as many of my videos as I can because it needs to be drawn attention to, when you've got the largest entertainment industry in the world far eclipsing something like Hollywood, then yeah, you're going to notice the DEI, the wokeness, you're going to notice all of that in gaming more and definitely first because it's got a, a much larger reach. There's a whole lot more public eyes on it. 
through a mold. That's why Gamergate was really the first thing that drew people's attention to wokeness. Gamergate wasn't where wokeness started, but Gamergate is 100% where the public perception of wokeness started just again to the general public people didn't know about wokeness in academia academia is not something that most people have their wide eyes on but most people have their eyes on fox news or cnn and when fox news and cnn start talking about racism in video games from either you know political side their people regular normies are going to take notice when milo yiannopoulos who was massive at the time is talking about fucking video games and ghostbusters 2016 Oh, a lot of more people are going to take notice of that than some fucking Marxist professor in a lesbian dance theory class when only 0.07% of people are fucking lesbians. Or a framework that they define and control. A very good example of this abuse of civil rights laws can be seen in how they've gotten enough woke toys who have wormed their way into academia to have created an entirely new definition of racism that, interestingly enough, completely contradicts the colloquial definition. Yeah, go, dude, boy, the average layman views racism as just ethnic prejudice, which logically concludes that ethnic collective guilt is at the root of the problem. However, in the cathedralite definition, they use prejudice plus power to be the definition of racism, which logically concludes that collective guilt is a good thing. And here's where the gigantic grift comes in. These activists who have wormed their way into positions of power and influence will equip- uh, I disagree with your premise here, Johnny Boy, about, about uh, wokeness being tied to climate change. Climate change did not really start coming to, to public consciousness until about the 80s. Uh, whereas wokeness started, uh, you know, uh, pl get planting its roots in the '60s. Now both are, are are part of the same tree. They're both roots of the same fucking tree at the end of the day, and they both got tied together very quickly. But I don't think that wokeness actually spawned from climate change, uh, and more the vice versa. Climate change spawned from proto wokeness in the '60s during the civil rights movement. Oh, well, the civil rights was the '50s, but during the the free love hippy dippy post civil rights movement between these two definitions. They will imply that if you don't yeah, support right, equity Adam. policies, then that means you must hate minorities and be a racist. But that doesn't make any sense. That's using both these definitions as if they are one. Because equity policies are based on the idea that collective guilt is good, which they are treating as exactly the same thing as simply ethnic prejudice, which views collective guilt as bad. Remember what I said earlier about how the general public will say that they agree with DEI only because they don't actually know what DEI is? Well, this is how. Because woke activists are not actually honest with what they... All right, before he goes on, here's the real reason people don't know what DEI is. People don't know what fucking equity is. Like, like think about it. Ask so go to someone on the street and ask them the definition of equity. Most of them don't know because that's not a common everyday used term because that's not what our the, our entire uh, social system is based on. So, of course, equity is not a commonly known term. Equality is a commonly known term because we grow up hearing about equality in school. and We're learning about the American history and the American Revolution and we're learning about the Constitution. Equality is, is ubiquitously uh, understood throughout all of America. Equity is not. So when you when, when uh, you bring the idea of equity up and people have no fucking idea what it is and you explain it to them poorly or intentionally lie about what it is, you can make it sound like a much better thing than it actually is. They believe. They know that their ideas are fundamentally Bingo, unpopular, so they would. deliberately contradict themselves and obfuscate yes, their ideology for the sake of optics. Quality. Yes, and when sadly, it's worked opposite. pretty well. People fall for this equivocation all the time. It's easy to see through it once you understand how it works. For example, if you watch someone like Ayana Press, yeah, meet instruction. Welcome, hour, bud. Appreciate you being here. I need to get you on the show sometime, but again, that's only if you know how it works. Which, again, most people do not know because, again, the woke activists have been infiltrating the education system for over 50 years. Were you taught how to spot Marxist equivocation fallacies in school? No? None of your teachers went over that? Yeah, exactly. Another big problem is cronyist financial systems like ESG. Environmental social governance is a topic... See, I feel real lucky I live in the Midwest, and here's why. We did. I don't know about you guys. I don't know about anybody else. You feel free to answer in the chat because I'm actually genuinely curious about this. I've never really thought about this until now since he said something in this video. So already W for the video because like we were saying earlier, makes you think. Now I grew up in the Midwest and I had, I had three. I can name them. I, I can immediately name all three. I had three teachers throughout my, my uh, eighth grade through 11th grade who were staunchly, and I mean fucking staunchly, anti-Marxist, and they would take any opportunity they could to preach about their, their vendetta against Marxism. And because of that, I had a good idea of what Marxism was very early on, uh, which is why jumping on the, the, the anti-woke train for me was super easy. I was there at Gamergate uh, 1.0 back in 2014 because I already had an idea of what Marxism was and by proxy cultural Marxism. But 
in the Midwest, we're very conservative. So it makes sense that we would ardently be, we would be ardently anti-Marxism. I, did any of you guys grow up actually having that? Like, like <laughs> Leon grew up in a cult. Um, no, sort of, kind of like, again, I, my mom, not really a cult, but I did grow up in a very weird way. Uh, but yeah, okay. So it's trashy drippers says same. So cool. But yeah, any anybody else? Like like did anybody else have their high school or, or late middle school teachers preach to them about how bad Marxism is? Because I can honestly say mine did, but that might not be normal. I'm only speaking from a Midwest perspective. Like that could use its own extremely long video. So I'll just go over the points that are relevant here. Problem with it is Good that reference. it is an investment metric that uses diversity, equity, and inclusion as one of its metrics. Basically, it's just a way for people who bow down to DEI to get money. And the problem with that is that ESG is an example of cronyism. It does not actually get its funds from a voluntary exchange within the free market. Rather, instead, it is funded through a partnership between the state and very large private managers, such as BlackRock or Vanguard. The best explanation of this comes from the Mises Institute. The first hint that something is wrong is the fact that many of these companies who are going for these investments are motivated by government subsidies. This means that ESG is actually much worse than most people realize, because to some degree, your tax dollars are actually paying for it. They're also motivated into ESG investing. Well, there is no to some degree. Like, their tax dollars are paying for it. ESG as a concept is funded by the United Nations. And all the funding that goes to the United Nations comes from funding from the, not all of it, obviously, because there's multiple countries that pay into it. But if you're an American citizen, America, the, the American government pays into the, 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 the United Nations. And, and frankly, we are the ones that, unless my info is wrong, are paying the most. So yeah, there's no, in a way, like he says, no, your tax dollars are fucking funding ESG. Absolutely. Uh, Stupinto says, yes, in Texas, we were taught the Native American becoming endangered was also a, in large part their fault. Our textbooks didn't tell us that, but I had some based ass teachers that did say that. So I fucking feel you. Uh, too late in the night to try and remember my teachers. Fair enough. What are you doing, Phantom War? Appreciate you being here. Through regulation. The way this happens is quite complex. So here's a quick clip from a Mises podcast that explains the relevant bits. Fair enough. Uh, the other thing that you see with these institutional investors and, and, and risk is that they say, well, one of the risks that we're trying to mitigate against is regulatory risk. And you should, you should, you should anticipate um, government regulations in these areas. And that, that's something that's risk to your business. And they're telling you that on the one hand, and then they go on the other hand with their lobbyists. And guess what? They're lobbying for regulations. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh, you better watch out for these risks. Meanwhile, I'm going to pay all these lobbyists to try to make those risks a reality. Um, so there's a lot of just underhanded activity going on at, at that level. So, yep, as it turns out, ESG is just a big fat scam that tries to masquerade itself as legitimate investing, when in reality, it's just political games. There's also an interesting study from Santa Clara. Dur now, the counter to that there's not really a counter. He is 100% correct about, about the lobbyists and ESG. However, both sides of the political game play that coin. However, uh, not, not just the ESG, but in general, that that's why lobbying as a concept, I say it should be banned, which is kind of goes against my, my anarchist beliefs because, you know, I, I believe in complete and total freedom. Hey, if people want to lobby, go for it. It's their right. However, I, that is just factually not sustainable. There's times when I have to sort of reconcile my, 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 you know, pro anarchy stance and, and just state that, look, some things, uh, at least as it currently stands, unless we go full on anarchy, the, 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 you, you have to go beyond libertarianism and go into straight anarchy if you don't want, because there's, you can even lobby in libertarianism. In fact, lobbying is almost encouraged because, hey, it's about the freedom of the individual. If they individually want to lobby, then hey, go for it. Lobbying is an issue on both sides of the aisle, and, and it affects far more than just ESG and woke left-leaning bogus. Also, Adam Rabiel coming in with that 149 super sticker. Bingo, bango, bongo. You get yourself the Zelda chime. Thank you so much, man. You didn't have to, but you did. It means the absolute world to me. Let us continue. Journal of International Law, which concluded that government laws and regulations are the more likely driver of the boom in ESG investing, which is a particularly interesting study because it looked at more than just the United States. It also looked at various European countries. The extremely close ties to the state of large investment management companies like BlackRock further confirmed the suspicions that this kind of cronious scam is definitely happening in backroom deals, with the relationship being so strong that BlackRock is often called a fourth branch of the United States government. A big one being how BlackRock is regularly hired to you manage- guys keep it coming, Alfredo Chorizo coming in with that bingo, bango, bongo, got that Dolorino!
Thank you so much, man. Once again, you didn't have to. You did. I, 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 I true. I can only say I appreciate it so much before it starts to feel like it's ringing hollow. But I do mean it. I'm only able to do this because you guys and and thank you so much. Like I, I, I truly do mean that. And yeah, I, I love Trezo as well. Trezo's great. That's the assets of the Federal Reserve, effectively rendering them too big to fail, effectively ensuring that they will always have funds available at the backup of the Fed money printer go burr. These same firms then have a lobbying and revolving door relationship with the state, where they can partake in cronyism where they lobby for rules that directly benefit their investment strategy. And because they manage these assets, they also have direct command over how ESG funds are allocated, which then controls the general market, of which, again, gaming is just a small part. The government then passes regulations and grants subsidies based on the ESG metrics, making it a self-fulfilling prophecy, which makes it look like ESG investments are a legitimate I offer Alfredo and Leonardo people who aren't paying full yes. attention. You can think of it as them using private companies as a proxy for them to circumvent the constitution. That's and then thank of course you, these thank laws you. directly great. control the market as well. While this is all an oversimplification, it is in a nutshell how the ESG scam operates. It is a deeply authoritarian system that tries to masquerade itself as a legitimate free market investment system, but in fact it is just a scheme to push the ideas of the cathedral onto the general populace without people noticing. And lastly, the final thing I need to point out here on how the cult of woke gained so much power Power is the utter uselessness of the boomer conservatism within the Republican Party. Talk dirty to me. I got no idea what this channel is, but you bet your sweet ass that after this video, I'm hitting that motherfucking subscribe button. And who knows, maybe I'm sending this homie a message being like, yo, come on my show. Because uh, he he's caught up to this point. We're about halfway through and up to this point He's been talking about all the negative aspects of the left, which don't get me wrong I completely agree with I'm on board fuck the left the left are a goddamn cancer But you cannot talk about how awful the left is and ESG is and all that shit without bringing up the complete and utter fucking incompetence of old-school conservatives Oh, make me hard daddy-o the Republicans could have and should have done something to these rules and regulations, rolling them back, either fully eliminating or at least reducing them in order to prevent the far left from exploiting them to gain so much power. Instead, Republican politicians basically sat on their butts doing absolutely nothing for decades as the far left abused these legal and financial power structures in order to advance a Marxist agenda. So not only does the far left woke activists win the culture war because of their financial and legal backing, but they also effectively have zero competition. They occasionally do a little bit. For example, the Daily Wire recently came out in favor of Gamergate 2.0, but it's still done in a way that's relatively milk toast, and it's basically too little too late. And, and... I appreciate what you're saying, buddy, but also the Daily Wire is controlled opposition. So in a nutshell, Marxist and woke ideologues abused every single power structure they could get their grubby little hands on in order to gain entry into academia, journalism, and ultimately politics. All the while, conservatives sat and watched doing absolutely nothing to remove the parasites multiplying under their feet. And boom, boom, blue collar coming in. Love you, dude. 3 a.m. and drunk. 10 shots, 6 drunks. Bro, I'm getting there. Homie got the vodka poured. I'm on glass numero uno, but we'll see where the night goes. Dude, you get yourself the Zelda chime. Thank you so much, my man. Can't wait to have you back on the show as well, because you're a goddamn sweetheart, blue collar. Until we have now reached a point where anyone working in the media, be it gaming or whatever, now has to bow down and kiss the ring of these parasites in order to survive in their cacistocracy. So now that you know how the prestige-seeking racket works and how it came to exist, suddenly a lot of these scandals of gaming and games journalism in recent times make a lot more sense, and it becomes possible to blaze through them much faster without really sacrificing any understanding, as it becomes painfully obvious that many of them were totally expected, to the point of them really being inevitable. So in this next section of the video, I'll just go over some of these scandals to show you what I mean. And we'll start with the sweet baby incident, which a lot of content creators have already gone over in extreme detail. But here's so him talking about the sweet baby incident, I feel like is a mistake because this was not the origin of Gamergate. Like, yeah, it's it's recent, and so we can it, it, maybe it's fresh on people's minds, but there's a reason Sweet Baby kicked off Gamergate 2.0. I feel like he should probably start at the beginning. But we'll see what happens. Also, I want to see what uh, creators he he used in the video here. So hold on a sec. Sweet baby incident, which a lot of content creators have All right, we got upper echelon, uh, critical already gone over in extreme. 
Give us some Hypno or some Atreus. Details. But here's a quick rundown. Oh, boy, Various Overlord, gamers indeed. discovered that this... Hey, there's my boy Dread Roberts. Okay, okay. We got some Dread Roberts in there. Consulting firm. Hey, Nerd Wars. Nerd Wars is right under Dread Roberts. Look at you guys. Nerd Wars and Dread Roberts getting featured in this video. How many views this video got? It has got 105,000 views, which actually I think is less than the Dread Roberts video he featured. It's still enough. Dude, that is righteous. Sweet Baby Inc. was using its influence in order to inject woke ideology into multiple AAA gaming studios. And because because the CEO has a big mouth, she accidentally admitted that one of their tactics was to effectively threaten their marketing teams in order to get what they want. It was also discovered that Sweet Baby was tied to getting ESG investments into the games industry, turning the companies into sellouts for a massive woke propaganda network connected to hundreds of corporations and political bureaucrats. The CEO also pulled the classic criticism equals harassment grift, falsely accusing gamers who were boycotting the game Sweet Baby Inc. had a hand in of harassment, which is a pretty typical woke ideologue tactic to play victim and cry bully when in fact they are the aggressor. Now, if game journoids were honest, this massive web of corporate corruption and money from ill-gotten games being funneled into pushing propaganda for a political ideology into the games industry would be a scandal worthy of widespread coverage. But of course, the problem is major game journalist publications are all part of the companies that have parent companies with financial ties to PR firms and asset managers and corporations who are a part. Uh, yes. So yes, what are you saying here is correct. Um, this isn't going to be covered by the mainstream media because this is all part of the machine that the mainstream media plays up as a, a you know, everyone is trying to downplay, I should say. Uh, but there's also the aspect of that, even though gaming is the, the, the largest entertainment industry in the world, it's still just an entertainment industry. So, the, the higher ups at the, the upper echelons of these individuals, like even you know, the baby wire, the daily wire, like you said, it was too little, too late. Fox News, they covered Gamergate 1.0. I can't recall if they you know covered Gamergate 2.0. And even if they did, well, much like the Daily Wire, Fox News is nothing but controlled opposition. You're not gonna get uh anyone to cover this through the reason being twofold, because A, like he's saying, everyone's involved in this, or B it's not going to be taken seriously. Like, oh, look at that. Fucking white people in video games. Like, that's not a fucking news story when you got World War Three almost at our doorstep and when Trump is running for president again. Like, it's just not going to be taken seriously. Part of this network, who are part of the cathedral, who are part of the regime. So, of course, publications such as Kotaku and IGN Don't gave run, extremely run, biased, run, one sided run, takes run. that deliberately obfuscated the facts. With the one from Kotaku being especially deranged and unhinged, as it attempted to trick readers into thinking that the claim that Sweet Baby Inc. was responsible for injecting woke ideology into games was somehow a conspiracy theory, despite the fact that this is something that Sweet Baby Inc. admits to doing on the front page of their own website. And then you might wonder, how the heck did Kotaku expect to get away with this kind of insane lie? Well, simple, really. They used the weasel word solely in their article, which is technically true. Sweet Baby Inc. is not solely responsible for the propaganda. Rather, they are just one part of a massive pipeline and just one of the many consulting firms pushing woke ideology in a massive ocean of piss. So then, of course, Kotaku uses this pedantically correct statement. Bro. I am more news than fucking Gutfeld. Like, let's be real. You, you you come to my channel, and I'm gonna drop more fucking facts than Gutfeld. Like, <laughs> meant to then say whatever lies they want, and then pretend that the entire scandal wasn't I mean, happening, toasty, which is, of course, completely doing, insane and I absolutely sure unhinged gaslighting, well. and also totally expected journaloid behavior. I mean, honestly, it would have been the, more surprising if videos over I invite the others on the show. This is partially why I personally haven't yet, really made very many videos on this subject. The Sweet Baby incident is really just an unsurprising expected result of the corruption and rot that has again been boiling for decades. These publications all have corporate financial ties or parent companies with financial and political ties to the greater regime. People working for these publications therefore obviously cannot publish facts which make their masters look bad without risk of getting fired. So dishonest articles like these being pushed out over various scandals in the gaming industry is just expected. A good piece further proving that this is the case came from a tweet from Niche Gamer, which aside from a few internal scandals, is one of the few actual responsible gaming news publications, due largely in part due to them being one of the few that tries to operate outside of the regime. And thus, they are one of the few publications that consistently somewhat tells the truth about these scandals. And this little tweet from them kind of lays out the whole thing. They can't risk telling the truth about the regime too hard without potentially getting punished by some PR firms that are hired by the same game companies. Because so I actually covered that when that happened. Um, because I, I, like, I like Niche Gamer a lot. I think Niche Gamer does a lot of good work and when they came out with that tweet they were fucking 
blasted by most people in the anti woke community. And I thought that was really unfair because, look, they're trying to bring you more or less anti woke news in the gaming in, in the gaming sphere, just like bounding into comics, for example. Their reach is affected by not getting advertisers. So there is an un, it's an unfortunate reality that there is a line that they need to walk when it comes to calling out the anti-woke, or when it comes to calling out the woke, I mean, and still being safe enough to to uh, you know to, to be able to post the articles so that people like me can find them and read them, and so their their tweets do appear on our social media so that we can see them. Like it, it's it is an unfortunate reality that in some regard they have to play ball because they're so large that. They have to play ball. Now, frankly, I'm going to be 100% honest with you. There will be a time when, when I'm large enough that I'm going to have to be given the choice, play ball or don't play ball. I'll be real. I ain't going to fucking play ball. I say faggot now. I'll say faggot when I got 100,000 subscribers. And if I get canceled, my channel gets axed. Oh, fucking well, my fucking channel gets axed because I said faggot. Like that, 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 Just know that that is a reality that I'm 100% prepared for. Uh, this channel will not be around forever because when given that option, I'm going to say no to playing ball. Uh, and, and the reason I can say that is because I'm, I'm not trying to brag when I say this. Every single month since getting monetized, I have made more the next month and more the month after that. And it, to the point where ne never any point is the amount of money I've made on YouTube made me reconsider, oh, I don't want to lose that fucking ad rev. I don't want to lose that super chat money. Maybe I should, maybe I should play this a little safe or whatnot. No, fuck that. Like, like at no point have I ever considered that. Now, niche gamer, they are a company. They have multiple employees. I'm a, I'm a solo man operation. Um, so I can take the fucking hit. Uh, if if that ever comes down to it, niche gamer, they are a legitimate business who has to actually worry about their employees. They have to worry about the futures, things to that effect, and. I'm not going to, I was one of the few people I, I saw defending niche gamer for saying we're going to play this safe because we have to for ad money. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. I would rather than play it safe. Get me the news on the safe side. I'll take their news and I'll give the fucking unfiltered version that says faggot all the time. Like that you, you guys are effectively a middleman for real unfiltered conversation and you're getting paid to be the middleman fucking play that middleman game because they rely on them for access journalism. And again, it's largely due to ideological capture of these media institutions. And so again, it would be more surprising if this kind oh, of scheme thank you very was much, not I, I This kind of corruption is just expected gaming industry behavior and will remain as such as long as the power structures which allow the Thanks, activist Anthem. entryism remain in place. Another scandal is the one where it is also frequently discovered I'm that journalists from these companies review games based on adherence to correct trademark ideology and connections as opposed to the quality of the game, such as what some of the journalists did to Stellar Blade in Hogwarts Legacy. Again, this should of course surprise no one. Woke ideology is inherently cacistocratic. In order to work for this propaganda network, you either have to be philosophically illiterate enough to actually believe this nonsense, or be dishonest enough to pretend that you believe in it in order to seek prestige within the network of woke. And thus it Okay, but is there anyone out there that we believe is actually philosophically retarded enough to believe this? Like, as much as we like to dunk and clown on Alyssa Mercante, for example, I believe she's smart enough to know that this is all bullshit. She doesn't believe the nonsense she's espousing. She just knows this is how you play the game, and 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 her uh, you know fake virtue is putting fucking money in her pocket, however little that is, and so she's going along with it. Also, there's a bit of pride and and, and spite wrapped into it as well. I don't know that there is anybody of any form of influence. Now you've got your fucking normies or, or your people that are even dumber than normies that do believe this shit. You got your people with 23 followers on X that do espouse this absolute bogus. But I feel like, and I could be wrong, but I feel like those who have gained some sort of platform and gained some sort of notoriety, they know it's bullshit. You can't operate in a capitalist society while claiming you're anti-capitalist and actually be anti-capitalist. That's, that's in, an, antithetical to how the world fucking works. But yet these people do it. Like, I, again, maybe I'm way off base, but I think that all, anybody of note, anyone with a platform is not actually uh, 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 believes in this ideology. They believe in the money and status that comes with faking like they believe in this ideology. Also, I saw some membership chats here. Yeah, from Artu Litu. Leon, you are very handsome and a manly man. That first one is very true. That second one is, it's a goal and a dream that I aspire to, and one day I'll get there. <laughs> Thank you, R2. Um, dude, they're nuts. No, 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 
They're nuts. I'm not saying they're not nuts. It's nuts to even fake like you agree with this stuff. But that's still not the same as actually believing it. It is entirely unsurprising that most droidoids are either likely to be fools or grifters or a little of both. Because in order to work at the heart of this industry, you almost have to be one. And so, of course, many of the reviews are either very stupid. Adam Rabiel coming in with that too for saying that we lost R2. No, no, no. We gained R2. The truth came out. And that's what matters is people just, oh, I'm a sound, I'm a sound like a wokey for a moment, but speak your truth. <laughs> you get yourself the Zelda chime, sir. Thank you so much, Adam. You didn't need to, but you did. You were just a man with a plan. You keep bringing the heat, and it means the world to me. Stupid or based on undisclosed backroom deals, because again, the it's industry has become cachistocratic. Another related like scheme to this is journalists like on The Verge me? whining about Japanese games not being woke enough, and thus giving an idiotic and ideologically motivated review to Final Fantasy XVI. The reason Japan tends to be more resistant to the woke cathedral is actually somewhat interesting. Japan doesn't have the same moronic disparate impact legislation as the West has, which means... Alright, I'm a, I want us to pay real close attention to this portion, because... It sounds like he's about to suck off Japan as the second coming of fucking free speech and artistic creativity when we all know, and I've been harping on it for months, that Japan has been taking cues from the West and has been taking ESG money. So he needs to acknowledge that. We'll see. It's one of the key power structures that Marxist abuse to gain entry is missing, and thus their attempts at hijacking Japanese media industry have been much slower. This is why when you do see a Japanese game bow down to the woke regime, it's usually due to outside financial pressure from the global stage. When you understand that this is why the journoid words have less influence on Japan, it makes perfect sense as to why these journoids tend to see that Japanese devs, but then get confused when they are simply ignored. Because here's the thing. So, yes, they're bowing down to outside money because the money is coming from the outside. But the fact of the matter is they're not sticking to their morals. They are taking the money. Now, are they taking the money because they want the money? Or are they taking the money because they agree with the, the ideology? Now, it doesn't really fucking matter. I don't care if Capcom agrees with the woke ideology or if they're just doing it for, mon for money. At the end of the day, whatever choice they make, that ideology has worked its way into the video game and is, does and is going to continue to infect an unsuspecting younger populace of people playing these games who haven't caught on to the shell game yet. So, I, that, to me, it seems like he's making excuses for the Japanese. And look, I'm a fucking weeb. I got an anime collection behind me, and I play a lot of Japanese games. But I'm not going to fucking let it slide and let it pass. Like, oh, look, they're doing it because of outside forces. No, no shit. Like, any company, any video game company that takes its ESG money is taking it from an outside source because the video game companies don't create the ESG money. They take it. So that's, I don't know. To me, that's, it seems like some cope because he wants to believe in Japan. And again, I'm liking this video and I appreciate the dude, but uh, nah, that this part of the video ain't it. I'm gonna be real. Thing. Most woke ideologues actually do not understand what I've been saying in this video. Again, the cathedral is not a conspiracy theory. It is just the natural result of ideological capture. Another scandal recently discovered was that Take This was allegedly getting government grants in order to push the false victimhood narrative about Gamergate, a narrative which I already debunked a long time ago. Again, totally unsurprising, totally expected behavior. Once you understand how the state funds the Cathedral of Wokeness, things like this should come across as little more than news that the establishment, as it turns out, is still in control and is still circulating false narratives which are then canonized as true in the resulting mainstream media circle jerk. And no, they're not going to stop lying about it. They are never going to stop falsely accusing people they don't like of harassment and sexism and whatnot. Because again, that is how this regime maintains its power. They play the victim and then circulate the false victim narrative until it becomes canonized as true. This also explains why Wikipedia continued to be useless within the Sweet Baby Ink controversy, producing yet again another useless biased article which regurgitates a false narrative that gamers are engaged in some kind of harassment campaign. Providing yet another fantastic example of people who disagree with game journos are bad people source game journos. This type of gaslighting, again, should be entirely expected at this point. Wikipedia still has the same insane rules where they consider journalist opinion to be of greater weight than primary hard evidence. So of course the Wikipedia article on Sweet Baby Inc. is just going to be mindlessly regurgitating the propaganda. Another thing worth pointing out is that gaming companies these days have tons of diversity hires who have been heavily casualizing and dumbing down. Okay, either I either I missed it or he didn't say it, but also Wikipedia is in and of itself a woke company. Not not only are they regurgitating the the propaganda because that is the common narrative amongst all these articles, but Wikipedia themselves are a woke company. I mean, as can be seen from their constant fighting with let's say Elon Musk, for example. So while anyone can go on there and edit any article, 
Wikipedia gets the, the last say, and they can put the kibosh on anything that goes against the accepted narrative. Wikipedia wants the accepted narrative to be the one of the woke ideology. They are, they, they, they are not just regurgitating information. Like, AI... AI regurgitates information. AI, the reason AI is woke, besides the fact that it's programmed to be, the reason AI is woke is because 80% of all articles on the internet are woke articles. And if your AI is learning off of what's on the internet, it's going to inherently be woke, programming or not. However, Wikipedia is real people. It's a real company. Now, granted, at this point in time and stage, there's probably AI in Wikipedia as well. But as a general rule, it's a real company ran by real people who do have real agendas. And the woke agenda is what they've decided to ascribe to out the industry and this should really again surprise no one kind of shown how game studios oh, i didn't hear about this that's hiring people bullshit. who don't actually provide any value but this is all just the logical result of their entryism tactics another thing that should surprise no one is neo-puritanism or game developers intentionally including course, ugly characters in their games and trying to shame male gamers for finding female characters who are attractive well attractive despite the fact that it's pretty easy to demonstrate that none of the journalists who do this kind of neo-puritanism behavior actually you know what? it's a damn shame twisted jack because ai is actually a really fucking amazing tool in a vacuum i'm i'm one of the people that has no problem admitting i am pro ai now obviously there's going to be limits at the end of the day it is a tool it's about how you use the tool i look at ai the same way i look at guns it's about the person behind the ai and how they're using it not the tool itself but again that's just me i know there's a lot of people that are ardently against ai and to me that makes no fucking sense if you're if you're a pro 2a but against ai you're a fucking idiot believe that sexuality is bad on principle, which proves that they're doing it simply because they don't like straight males. Again, not surprising at all when you remember that woke ideology has a praxis that includes envy and hatred at whatever group is deemed to be successful or on top of the progressive stack. They think that if you're a straight man, then you have it easier, and therefore they have envy and hatred towards you. And woke puritanism is just one way for them to vent that hatred no while shot. pretending to be virtuous. Aside from the age-old Gamers Are Dead campaign that happened during Gamergate, it's just another piece of evidence that these prestige-seeking cathedralites ultimately hate their own audience. And unfortunately, I could go on and on and on like this, because there's tons of other scandals. Like, for example, the recent rumor about Wukong devs, where they are allegedly being extorted for $7 million dollars by woke DEI consulting firms. And that's Every the time. entire reason we're seeing all these hit pieces against them, is because they refuse to pay up. This is a pretty typical tactic, so it's probably true. Or how about the bridge and DEI connection? Well, not a big surprise at all. There are actually tons of companies pushing DEI and ESG. In fact, here's an interesting red pill for you all. You can easily find these companies if you just act like you are a business that is looking for their guidance. If you just Google something like consultancy firms to help my business get ESG funds, you're going to find tons and tons of these companies, all offering their wonderful guidance on how to gain the ESG integration into your business and compliance. It's about so 2 30 a.m. my time. Uh, we're going to be going for about another as long hour, as the power structures I mentioned like earlier remain in place. Welcome. DEI is absolutely not going anywhere. Which then just brings up the question, what exactly can gamers do then? How can we fix gaming if the reason that it's become corrupted is due to such a complex hydra of government corruption, woke ideological capture, and corporate insanity? Well, the first thing gamers can do is just be aware of these authoritarian power structures and stop supporting them. Stop. All right, I'm going to get real nerdy here for a sec, but Scooby Pup said this, and this is my fucking trigger word. Uh, no, a zombie apocalypse will never happen. Now, there could be viruses that are zombie-like, like, you know, like, like a, um, a mutation of mad cow disease, which severely destroys uh, the, the cognitive functions of the brain and makes you run on instinct and whatnot, and, and is, it could be infectious. Uh, but there is, as it currently stands, uh, minus it being some sort of biblical, non-scientifically explainable fact of the, uh, of the dead rising, there is no way for the dead to come back and, and be reanimated in a way that would be any sort of meaningful uh the the, the way that the, the muscle tissue and, and, and the brain functions that would would just completely deteriorate uh it's it basically a zombie apocalypse via a a virus would die off itself before it causes any legitimate um massive damage but again if you've got like a like a 28 days later sort of situation where they're not actually zombies. They're infected people. Cause zombie specifically means dead reanimated back to life. Okay. That's a different story. Just throwing that out there. 
stop booting for people who hate you and stop booting to give the government more power in hopes that they will stop abusing their power. Not going to happen. The DNC, for example, Almost in the United States is very heavily involved with ESG funding, and they absolutely love to pretend like it's in support yeah, of the eight free market. Left. It is all a big, gigantic grift. If it really was something in support of the free market, then why do they need so many regulations protecting it? And why is it that a big motivator for this investment scheme happens to be subsidies and more regulations? But that's honestly a more difficult political side of things. An easier thing that people can do is just be aware of how woke ideology works and why it is flawed. I've posted several videos on my channel that explain how woke ideology is inherently self-contradictory and based on assumptions that are just demonstrably not true. The more people who understand how this ideology works and understands how to refute it can eventually bring us to a point where these ideologues will have trouble spreading their ideology because they will be immediately exposed as fools when they try. Or even- Ah, he is being far too optimistic here. So here's the dealio. Most people oppose this nowadays. The, the, the cultural Marxism, the woke ideology, that ideology is mainstream known but not mainstream agreed with. The pendulum has already swung to the point where people disagree with it, but it is so entrenched in the financial culture, uh, in the financial power structure and, and cultures of our uh, of our higher up elites and, and forms of government that it is going to take more than people just knowing about it to slowly weed it out. People need to actively fucking fight it. An easier way for gamers to rise up is just take the gatekeeper's pledge. Stop giving money to people who hate you. Seriously, this is so simple. The people working for these companies that absolutely me, yes. despise you. It's actually not just if you're a straight white male. If you're a woman or if you're a minority and you don't bow down to their ideology, guess what? They hate you too. They hate everyone and anyone who isn't them. And in some cases, that's not even true. They often turn on each other. After all, the ideology is functionally yeah, nonsensical. Said, and their inherent self-contradictions cause them to eat each other quite frequently. The point here is these people have no respect for you. If you are a gamer and you like gaming for the sake of gameplay, they hate you. And therefore, you should not give them money. It really is as simple as that. And there are many ways you can do this. For instance, give Sweet Baby Inc. Detected a follow and don't buy their crappy games. As proven Bang. from Sweet Baby Inc. CEO's total meltdown on Twitter, this is a very effective way to resist their propaganda. And it's fantastic because it also tricks them into telling on themselves. The completely unhinged and entitled attitude they have when you just tell them that you're not going to buy their garbage pretty much just speaks for itself. It shows everyone who's paying attention what kind of person they are. And it also just further proves that mainstream gaming journalism is completely fraudulent and corrupt when they try to defend said unhinged behavior. And it's not just because of the ideology that you should avoid these games. If you understand how market incentives work, you might realize that woke games are actually just a signal that a game dev is not confident in their ability to make a good game that people actually want to buy because they feel the need to rely on these outside funds and outside... I disagree with that. Most game devs, I do believe, are, are, are confident in their ability to make a good game. What they're not uh, confident in is their ability to market a good game, which is where Sweet Baby Inc. and their ilk really come in. It's I mean, yes, they they they, they rewrite the characters and they rewrite the story and they make white you know white dudes into black women and whatnot, but that's not to make the game as a developed game better. That's to make the optics better for the marketing because oh hey, people want more diversity in games. I feel like that's a key difference in what he said there versus the actual practical application. ESG investments instead of real sales from real gamers. It is therefore entirely reasonable for people to well, avoid Star Wars Marvel Purist, even if you don't really mind the woke crap, because if a game developer isn't confident that they have designed something that people will want. It's a pretty big sign that you probably don't want it. Another thing in regards to corporate games journalism is don't even give them attention. They have abused their platform to spread fraud and propaganda, and so they fully deserve the negative respect from the gaming community that they're getting now. Not zero respect, negative respect. These publications have allowed themselves to be filled with Marxist ideologues, and thus it is entirely reasonable to assume that everything they publish is either not true or in an absolute best case scenario, completely milk toast, and therefore just not even worth your time to read. Another important thing about this strategy is don't do anything violent or illegal. That's what they want you to do. They desperately want you to do extremist stuff so that they can portray us as the bad guys. And by not doing extremist stuff, we are forcing them to tell these insane lies where they have to bend over backwards and commit multiple logical fallacies to contort themselves into this ridiculous pretzel where they're basically saying that us refusing to buy their games 
is somehow harassing them, which is an obviously stupid narrative. And the longer we force them to stick with that insane propaganda, the easier it will be for more normies to see that we are in the right. And our strategy toward journalists who lack any kind of ethics should just be total journoid dismissal, which means that we just dismiss everything that they say. Journoids from platforms like Kotaku, Actually, The Dexter, Verge, it's funny. I've been, and we're almost on the video, guys, I promise. One of the last one, one of the last few times I pause. We do got to stay woke because woke tradition, we just got to use the original definition of woke. Woke means awake to the power structures and everything going on in the world around you. So in all reality, these individuals have co-opted woke, changed the meaning, and have turned it into something it really isn't. And us exposing them for what they are and, by, and pulling back the curtain and realizing how this all actually works on the back end is the true definition of woke. So if you want to call me an anti-woke content creator, fair enough, go for it. But really, me... Hypno, Atreus, we're actually woke content creators because we are pulling back the curtain and showing how this is all a fucking lie, which is the original definition of woke. Polygon, Wired, etc. have a proven track record of lying and pushing political propaganda. Thus, they have destroyed their credibility, and we should just dismiss everything they say as fraudulent and untrue until proven otherwise. Also, just realize that the boycott strategy is a lot more effective than most people this. realize. If game companies and journal publications that have given in to the ideological capture consistently fail to generate revenue, it takes away their ability to fund the regime further and thus makes it easier for those power structures that I've mentioned that they rely on to be dismantled. The gatekeeper's pledge may seem silly, and some of the points on this image are a little bit silly. But the reality is, the only thing stopping it from working is just not enough people doing it. ESG and corporate backing does in fact have a limit. Also, consider redirecting that money and attention to the few game companies and independent news sites that actually go against the woke regime, such as The Great Rebellion, whose developers I recently worked with, or outlets like Geeks and Gamers that actively stand against the prestige-seeking behavior. Or in other words, do not be afraid to support alternative institutions. And do not feel bad practicing physical removal against communist psychopaths. These people do not deserve your time and they do not deserve your money. And they, again, have nothing but disrespect for you. And if you happen to be a business owner, you should avoid allowing them to work for you under any circumstances. Being an imagine if the roles were reversed cuck is bad. Do not be an imagine if the roles were reversed cuck. These people in thereby posing an open threat to all private property and property owners must not only be shunned, but they must, to use a by now somewhat famous Hopper meme, be physically removed. Marxist ideologues will always try to destroy your organization from within, and trying to use principles against them doesn't work because they do not actually have any principles. And finally, if you haven't already, consider giving the articles on deepfreeze.it a read. While the information may seem dated, a lot of it is still relevant to today. Mainly, it serves as a relatively good repository of evidence that Gamergate was, indeed, all along, about ethics and games journalism. And everybody telling you otherwise is either misinformed or fell for the propaganda. Or is just a prestige-seeking cathedral like Grifter who is lying to you. And that's why Gamergate today honestly just kind of still stands as a basic test of media and ideological literacy. And the general points that are made on deepfreeze.it are just as true for Gamergate 2 or the Sweet Baby Inc. scandal as they were for Gamergate. But the most important thing I really want people to walk away from this video understanding is that these scandals are all part of a much, much bigger problem. It is not just in gaming, and it is not solely the responsibility of Sweet Baby Inc. Getting rid of Sweet Baby Inc. would honestly not fix a darn thing. As long as those authoritarian power structures remain in place, some other band of prestige-seeking cathedral-like grifters would just rush in to take their place. Anyways, that is all. Thanks for watching, and thanks for everyone's patience as it took me slightly longer to get this video out than I was aiming for. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe, and if you want to support me, you can do so on either Ko-Fi or Subscribestar, or again, I am holding a merch store sale in order to help fund the time oh, I spent on this show. And again, there are mugs now, so the merch store is not just shirts anymore. But yeah, that is all. Till next time. That was excellent. I am certainly going to reach out to this individual. Uh, here, I'm dropping the link in the chat because uh, I want to... Honestly, guys, it would be great for you to go drop this guy a like if you feel like you want to drop him a sub, by all means as well. Uh, but uh, frankly, we just stole his content for about an hour, hour and a half. And so uh, while I feel like we did a great job of ad adequately doing fair use, um, still would not hurt to, to, to give the dude his dues. Uh, I really enjoyed that. I, I'm legit going to find out if I can reach out to him. I think he would make a great guest on the countercast but let's go ahead
and bring you guys on. I know this is what you've been waiting for. Yes, you did survive. I appreciate all of you sticking with me. Um, Linux, Lizard Linux Lane put that in my uh, put that in my uh, tw- you know, sent me that on Twitter, and I was like, this could make for some good content. And I think it did. We had a lot of really good discussions based on this video throughout the course of this. 